tonight, some of you may have seen, what I'm going to talk about is hereafter, but I'm going to tell you, there are some messages that I just try to get away from. Honestly, this is probably one of them. I was reading in Revelation and come across a verse and uh, one word out of that verse, particularly hereafter, just struck me. And I was already very settled on this morning. I had no doubt that that was the message for that particular hour that God had given for that time and the people that were here. And likewise for tonight, even though I tried to find something else to preach. So generally when you talk about hereafter, that's more of a Sunday morning salvation message. Maybe it's needed for a Sunday night, so that's what we're going to go with. I'm going to read out of Revelation, uh, and I'm going to bounce around a little in Revelation, but I'm going to start. We're going to read Revelation 1 and 11, and then I'm going to drop down and read just the very end of 17 through 19. So as you find that, if you would stand or if you just want to read off the screen. And if you look in Revelation, you will see that uh, this is where Jesus first spoke in 11 and then uh, in 17 was the next place, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. If you drop down to 17, I'm just going to read, uh, if you've got a red letter Bible, just what's in red in 17. Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter heavenly father i just simply pray for your anointing tonight lord to preach your word as you would have it not as i would have it not as anybody here would have it but god as you would have it because your words are true and faithful and righteous lord let your word accomplish what you will and Lord, let what we do in this house glorify and honor you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, y'all know I, I love Revelation. It's written by John. That's uh, where I've probably spent an undue amount of time in the Bible. I tend to read the same things over and over a whole lot and the other parts a little. And John and Revelation are two of those that I usually spend a lot of time in. And when you get to the very first part of Revelation, what you have is John, who has been exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Uh, tradition says that they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil, and he did not die, and he was exiled to this Isle of uh, Outcast from the Roman Empire. And as he was there, he says that on the Lord's day, he was in the Spirit. So in other words, there come a day, and, and generally we believe that to be Sunday, but if we're real honest about it, every day is the Lord's day. He made Monday just the same as he made Sunday. He made Saturday just the same as he made Wednesday. So we're not exactly sure what day, but I take it to be Sunday, the Lord's day, that he was resurrected from the grave. And John was caught up in the Spirit. And when he was caught up in the Spirit, the first thing that he heard was Jesus talking to him, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. That's back up in verse 8. And then you have Jesus telling him, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. In other words, Jesus encompasses all of our history, even history that is not yet written. Because to Jesus, it is all history. We look at history and we think of things that happened back in time. December uh, 7th, 1941 is a day that will live in infamy. That's the day that Pearl Harbor was attacked. September 11th, 2001 is another one of those days. Even more tragic in terms of loss of life. That the, the Twin Towers were attacked and fell down and we lost thousands upon thousands of lives. There are things in the history book that we look back at and it happened yesterday but to God even tomorrow is history because he knows the beginning from the end 
He is the first and the last. He has already bookended everything that's going to happen. And matter of fact, the hereafter, and I'll get to that in a bit, is already written. There is nothing to determine about what the outcome of mankind is. Matter of fact, I would even go further to tell you that you don't have to look very hard to figure out what your outcome is. Not just of mankind, but of your outcome. Why? Because the Bible is already put in black and white. Like that song says, it's black and white, it's not gray. It is already set in stone what behaviors, what fruits, what heart, what is necessary for you to enter into the kingdom of God. And he tells him to write into the churches. Now, I believe, and I've said this before when we covered Revelation, those were seven actual physical churches that were in Asia. They were on a trade route, and it pretty well encompassed uh, most of the, the known world that was trading in Asia anyway. So I really think it's both symbolic and I think it's historical. Those seven churches existed, but I believe he picked seven to show that this is a letter to all churches for all times. It was symbolic that it's not just for the church in, in Pergamos. It's not just for the church in Philadelphia, but it's also for the church at Mill Creek. It's also for the church anywhere else in the world on this day in this time. But he tells us in words, and you heard them this morning in the text that I read out of Psalm, fear not. We see fear not in Isaiah. We see fear not throughout the Old Testament. We see it throughout the New Testament. Fear not. I am the first and the last. And we look at our current situations and, and oftentimes, yes, we do fear. We don't want certain things to happen and we will let worry and all of these things overtake us. We will let life get the better of us sometime. If you want to hear more about that, just go back and listen to this morning. I'm not going to retread all of that. But sometimes we do get into this place of fear, even though he has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power and sound mind and love to be able to overcome. He tells us, greater is he that is in, in me than he that is in the world. We know that we've got someone that is able to overcome because he has already set into motion everything that's going to be. He is all powerful, but yet we still fear and we still need the words, fear not. But he says that it is he that liveth and was dead. And behold, alive forevermore. And that has the keys of hell and of death. Now to me, I think that's pretty simple. Keys represent authority. They represent power. They represent the ability to shut off or open up. And friends, can I tell you that hell is not locked off right now. Jesus has the keys but it is not locked off right now. If it was, we wouldn't have demons running rampant. We wouldn't have sin covering the face of the earth. If death was already gone, we wouldn't be burying family members. We wouldn't be burying moms and dads and aunts and uncles and kids and grandkids and all of these people that we have to bury day after day after day. These are still open because we are still in a is state of mind. We have what was, we have what is in front of us, but we still have something in front of us too. Because he said, you need to take care of those things which you've already seen. Now, I believe what John had seen was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about this revelation, though that is part of it. But what he had seen was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. He had seen Jesus Christ come and walk the earth and heal Bartimaeus so that we no longer need to call him blind Bartimaeus. He seen him take Peter's mother-in-law and raise her up from a fever. He's seen her or seen God walk in to Jairus' house and heal his daughter. He's seen all of these things. He's seen the woman with the issue of blood pressing through because she had had 12 years of all that she could take and seen her instantly healed by the power of God working through Jesus Christ. So what was, was recorded. Matter of fact, in John, in the Gospel of John, it tells us that if he recorded everything, there's not enough books to contain it. So what was, was the revelation that God came to us in the flesh. That he sent his only begotten son. 
What, what has been is that he was sent to the cross to die for us, tempted in every manner as is common to man, yet without sin. That he went and he suffered that forsakenness so that we don't have to. Because he hung on the cross and when he took our sin, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What's the revelation that he was sent into a grave, that he was buried in a tomb that was not his, and when they went back, the stone was already rolled away, and Jesus Christ was alive again. He is risen. He is no longer in a grave. He is today seated at the right hand of God the Father. He has already entered in once for all into the Holy of Holies and applied not the blood of bulls and goats and heifers onto an altar, but He applied His own blood that still runs fresh today so that we have a way of reconciliation unto the Father. That is what was. It's already done. And the things which are. You can read through those letters to the seven churches. And I, I, I feel like that's probably a portrait of today. Most churches have something good in them. Now if you read through all seven, I believe it's five that have at least something good. Now there are several of them that also have some bad. If we're being truthful, we've probably got good and bad here. There's things that we need to work on. There's things everybody needs to work on. There was only two of them that had no rebuke. Today we're much the same. That is the is. We are here. We fear sometimes. We stumble sometimes. We mess up sometimes. But thank God that we have what was, that we can always go back to the foot of the cross that we've got a God that loves us and cares for us. And when we will repent, when we will go back to him, he will no longer hold that against us, that it will be wiped out. Now, all of that is bonus because what I really want to focus on is that last part. The things which shall be here after. Sometimes we like to skirt around on the hereafter. We don't like to talk about what's next. We'll read one verse about it. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, or enter in my good and faithful servant. And we'll pretty much stop at that and we don't get into graphic descriptions of what's next. Y'all that are regular here, that are members and have been here for the whole time that I have and heard me preach, you've heard me say time and again that heaven and hell is not your final destination. And we need to understand that. Heaven will be very much just a temporary stopping point, just like this earth is for us. Likewise, if you end up in hell, which is also part of the hereafter, it will only be a temporary stop, albeit a much longer one. Because at the end of the end of the end is a new Jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth. And at the end of the end is no longer hell, but it's a lake of fire. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about hell to begin. You see, I don't know that we really have a good understanding of it. And I was trying to think of a good way to put how hell and the lake of fire would be. And I do believe that the lake of fire will be much worse. I believe it will be much worse than what hell is. I believe hell will mostly be mental torment. And why do I say that? There's multiple scriptures that talk about it. I'm going to cover some of them. But I want to try to paint you a picture with words. And that's not my strong point, but I'm going to try. Have you ever been at a place in your life where you really felt like you had no hope? where you just simply did not see a way out. That despair that you would feel down in your soul. And you didn't think that anybody would be able to help you. You could look and you could see life. You could see your neighbors. You could see your friends. You could see your co-workers. You could see family. And they were just going on about life. And you had on this nice, neat face. And you covered it all up and you shoved it inside of you. 
But yet as you walked around, you walked much like what we would call walking like a zombie because you were just kind of going through the motions. You had no mind about you at all. And all you could see was an, an ungood end. I know that's terrible English, but you seen no good coming out of your life. You see no way that you could ever move forward. Now multiply that by numbers that I can't even fathom. Because what we think is no hope, we're still seeing life around us. When we think we no, have no hope, we still have signs that will pop up in front of us. Sometimes it might be a church sign. And it will prompt a little something inside of you. Yes, Jesus is still alive, so maybe there is a little hope for me. A friend will say something and there will be a glimmer of something in it that may even bring a smile to your face, even in the midst of your despair. You see, while we're walking this earth, even though we may hit places where we feel like we have no hope, there are still glimpses and, and glimmers of hope throughout the day. Because we still see life going on around us. But when we get to a place called hell, that is erased. And what may even be the worst part of it is that you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that where you are, you never, ever, ever again will have the hope of Jesus Christ. And not only that, you will have at least, at least, if you die at the very beginning of the thousand year reign and you are sent to hell, you will have a minimum of a thousand years to set and ponder in total separation from all good with nothing but evil all around you, contemplating that there is coming a day when not only will you be mentally tormented from a lack of hope, but you also have at the end of that thousand years to look forward to physical torment added on top of it. All because of decisions you made. Make no mistake, God sends no one to hell. But listen to me clearly, your decisions that you make every day of your life is what sends you to hell. Your actions send you to hell. And if we want to be very blunt, what sends you to hell is refusing and rejecting to submit to the blood of Jesus Christ. It really is that simple. But yet we walk around... And sometimes we act like Pontius Pilate. Now let me explain what I mean about this. Here's something that can uh, be detrimental to your eternal life. You see, Jesus was taken to Pilate. If you'll go back and you'll read the crucifixion stories, Jesus was taken to Pilate. And Pilate looked at him and he said, I find no fault in this man. In other words, he was that casual churchgoer that would come in and he knew that there was no fault in Jesus, that he was good, that what he was doing was good and wholesome. But yet he also listened to the world, he listened to the other voice, even after he sent him to Herod and he was brought back, he tried to release him again. And when he tried to release him again, instead of doing what he knew was right, he did what the world wanted, which was wrong. He said, good enough, I'll listen to the world's voice, and I'm going to send this man to his death. Now, oddly enough, maybe we ought to be thankful for Pilate, because he's the one ultimately that sent him to the cross to shed blood so that I could live. Now, I know that sounds strange and you may disagree with me and that's okay. But see what Pilate did is what Jesus had already spoke about in Matthew 10 and 28. He said, fear not them which kill the body. See, and that's exactly what Pilate did. He feared those that could kill the body. He feared what would happen to him with more uprising. He didn't want to lose his prominence. He didn't want to lose his prestige. He didn't want to lose his life. So he feared them which could kill the body. Jesus said, fear not them which kill the body, but are 
and, and, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now we like to talk a lot. Well, I can't help getting out of this lifestyle that I live in. Mommy did this and daddy did that. Shut up. Just shut up. I know that's harsh, but it's the truth. Your mommy and daddy ain't going to hell or heaven for you. You are. Now, if you don't believe it, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Oh, that's, that's New Testament. No, it's not. It's Old Testament. It's Ezekiel. We like to say the Old Testament, the, the sins are visited to the third and the fourth generation, which is certainly scripture. It was true. But God, through his prophet Ezekiel, said that, no, you're, that may be true. They may have a hard life because of the decisions you made. Now, I'm telling you, you can make things easy or hard for your children. And we've all got agreements and disagreements on exactly what that is. One may think that handing them everything is making it good for them. The other one may think that exact same thing is bad. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about their sin gets them into hell. Your sin gets you into hell. It, their sin has no bearing on you. Oh, God loves me too much. God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. God did that to them. Because they rebelled, because they refused to submit, because they refused to live in the freedom of the Son, He'll do it to you. All because of your decisions. Because you whined about someone else's sin being your guilt? No. No. Because you feared those out there instead of God. There's a lot of other verses too. Let me run through some of them. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew 25, 46, Psalm 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forgot God. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, you are troubled with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. I'm going to read more of that here in a second. But how do I know that this place called hell is a separation from God and a lack of hope? Because Paul tells us in Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Hell is a place where you no longer have any experience, contact, or hope of being with God. Matthew 13, 49 through 50, So shall it be at the end of the world, and the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them, the wicked, into the furnace of fire there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth mark 9 and 43 and if thy hand offend thee cut it off it is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two good hands or having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched jude 7 even as sodom and gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Matthew 13, 41, 42. Son of man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Then shall he 
Say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25 and 41. Hell is real. Hell is real. And hell is a place that if you do not make the decision to follow Jesus Christ, that you will never have a chance of escape. If you're there, it's done. And I've said before, people say, only God can judge me. I'm getting ready to read what happens with that. There's a judgment seat of Christ, which is the judgment of the righteous. Now, I pray to God that He is not the only one that will judge me. I want to be at the judgment seat of Christ. Because the judgment seat of Christ Ultimately, if we just want to put it in good old hillbilly language, is going to determine how many crowns you can cast at the feet of God. Amen. But then there's this other judgment. There's this other judgment that comes along in Revelation 19 and 20. Actually, 20. But before we get to 20, I want to look at 19 just for a minute. And I want to kind of put a wrap on hell and get to a little bit of heaven before we get out of here tonight. I need to lift y'all up a little. Y'all got long faces right now. And look, maybe I ought to just do an altar call if it's making your face that long. Maybe there's something we need to work out. You know, it does say work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And after these things, hereafter, hereafter, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah, or Alleluia. Her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice come out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent, all-powerful, reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's hereafter. Now the question is you're supposed to be his wife. I don't care if you're male or female in here you're supposed to be his wife. That's a sermon for another time. Have you made yourself ready? Have you made yourself ready? Down in 11 it says, He saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And what he's coming to do is to capture the beast and to bound Satan for a thousand years. Verse 20, or chapter 20, says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. It's going to be a thousand years of peace. Let me go down to verse 7 in chapter 20. I know I'm skipping a lot, but we've covered Revelation a lot before. It says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. But here's how that concludes, going down to verse 11. Saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven 
fled away. There was found no place for them. All those that had rebelled, all them that was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, the beast, the false prophet, they're already there. And he saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. The dead were just out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. I know we're saved by faith, but friend, if you're saved, you better be doing some work. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Who wants to die twice? I don't particularly want to die once. Why would you want to die twice? Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It gets no more black and white than Revelation 20, 15. If your name is not found in the book of life, you will be cast into the lake of fire. But then, you know, there's an alternate hereafter. Let me try to pick you up for about five minutes and then I'll turn you out. Let me try to pick you up a little because I've beat you down tonight, have I not? And that's not my intent. My intent is so that you know, so that you can talk intelligently to other people. So that if there's something going on in your life that you need to get squared away, I do not want you to have this fate. I do not want you to have welling and gnashing of teeth. I don't want you to have to suffer separation from God and from the power of His glory. I don't want you to have to cry, why have I been forsaken knowing all along it was your choice? Chapter 21. <coughs> and I saw a new heaven. And a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. We shouldn't have to go any further than right there. If you followed along what I'm telling you tonight, I should not have to read one more word to make you want to shout if you were following God Almighty. Because there are two different paths that you can take, and one of them is a place that surely no one in their right mind would say, I want to go there. No one in their right mind would say, I want to die twice. No one in their right mind would want to go to, to the devil who has less power, less authority, only what is given to him, forsaking the almighty God that knows the end from the beginning, that has all power, that can see everything, that ultimately will take perfect care of us. That same God says that if we will simply follow after him, that he will dwell with us. And not just dwell with us, but we will be his people. And that God himself, not just God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, not just the comfort of the Holy Spirit, but this God that no one has ever laid physical eyes on, other than to see his backside as he passes by the rock. That no one has ever looked up on will all of a sudden be right in front of us. And He Himself will be with us and be the God that we've longed for all of our life. This morning I talked about they that sow in tears shall reap joy, right? Everyone in here sowed a lot of tears. I have no doubt 
that people in here have sowed a lot of tears over children, over parents, over grandparents, over grandkids, over brothers, sisters, jobs, life in general. But here's what's part of that new heaven, that new Jerusalem. You see, just like hell is going to be picked up and cast into the lake of fire, we, I hope I'm one of them, I, I, I'm striving for it, that are in heaven, will have a new residence. At the end of it all, we'll have a new residence. And it's going to be a place where in Revelation 21 and 4, it says, God shall wipe away all tears. Every tear that you've sown, if you want the conclusion that knows that you are going to reap in joy that I read you this morning out of Psalm 126, here it is. At the very end of days, when everything is said and done, every tear that you've ever cried, not Jesus Christ, not the Holy Ghost comforting you, but God Himself will reach down, the God that can hold the entirety of all of creation, even the furthest... Uh, Planets and stars and galaxies that we know of will fit here and then the other side will fit here and we're just somewhere in between. He is going to be so intimate with us that he will reach down and he will wipe away the tears that you have sown night after night, day after day. He will come down and then you will experience a joy that is like no other because you will never have to cry again. You will never have to physically hurt again. You will never have to wonder why again you will never have to wonder when is something going to happen again because you will be right in the very presence of God Almighty and he cares so much for you that he is going to reach down and cradle you he's going to reach down and comfort you he's going to reach down and ex exchange those tears for shouts of joy and shouts of adoration and shouts of praise and you are going to fall down at his feet and you are going to to worship and praise Him in ways that you cannot even imagine. Because there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There's going to be no more pain because everything that was former is going to be gone. We talk about a new creature in Christ. We ain't just going to be a new creature or a new creation in Christ. We're going to be completely and totally new because he that sat up on the throne, that's God himself. We're not just going to be uh, renewed in our mind. We're not just going to be renewed through the power of the spirit. But this mortal will put on immortality. This corruptible will put on what is incorruptible. He that sat up on the throne said, behold, I make all things, all things new. But here's where I'm going to end this. You see, he didn't just say he would make all things new. But he looked at John one more time, just like he did at the beginning of the book. He said, write. Write about what you've already seen. Write about this revelation of my son, Jesus Christ. Write about what you know to be the truth of God. Write about what is going on now and send it out to these seven churches on this trade route so it gets out into all the world and it lasts forever. Write about these things that you are going to see that will be hereafter. What I've told you about tonight. A lake of fire and a new Jerusalem. But then he looks at John one more time and he says, and he said unto me, write. Revelation 21 and 5. After he said, I'm going to make all things new. And he said unto me, write. These words are true and faithful. Everything I've told you tonight has been right out of the book that God inspired through the power of His Holy Spirit. God cannot lie. He is incapable of lying. He is all-powerful. He is the very beginning and the very end of all of history. To God, even the New Jerusalem is already history. All you need to do to make it there is to follow Jesus Christ. It is that simple. Just follow Jesus. And I've got a very simple question for you tonight. Are you ready for the hereafter? 
Are you ready for the hereafter? We're going to play some music and I'm giving this very simple altar call. If you're not ready, come and get ready. If you are ready, come and pray for strength to endure to the end because that is the one that shall be saved. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. The altars are open.